Welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations. My name is Jo Haberman, and I'm very glad um, for being able to welcome today and introduce to you Richard Poinder. Welcome, Richard. Thank, thanks for making time for, ah, yeah, thank you for making time for this uh, conversation today. No problem. <laughs> glad to talk to you. Okay, so Richard, you're an independent science blogger, as you define yourself. Um, and I've, I've, I've seen um, quite, or I've been also partly astonished and also ha happily so. Um, and so basically you, you sensitize people like myself of what was the benefits, but also the potential um, pitfalls with open access. And um, as much as open access is something that I think we can commonly agree on is I don't know if I should say it's per se a good thing, but opening information to a wide audience, um, like all of whom have access to the internet nowadays, um, also research output. I think particular researchers who know well about the topics they're releasing or sharing mm. their results on are possibly aware of the potential negative impacts that might come with releasing such information, but also there's all kinds of dimensions to it, which um, we can probably touch upon in this conversation in a few of those. But before we do that, would you share with us a little bit about your background? You mentioned you're coming from an, an arts, um, you have an arts background, not a scientific training per se. But when and how did open access spark your interest or when did you engage into science journalism and science blogging? Well, uh, well originally I was an English teacher in a secondary school, but then um, I got interested in technology and we had a view data system in the UK called Prestel, which was like an online system before the internet. And I started publishing um, on that and uh, that was acquired by British Telecom, in fact, and so we ended up working for British Telecom. And then um, at some point I moved out to do freelance journalism and started writing about intellectual property. So I was writing about patents and copyright and trademarks. And at some point as I was doing that, I began to realise that there was a big debate coming up. Uh, because historically everyone had been obsessed with the idea of patenting and copywriting everything. And then with the arrival of the internet, people started to say, well, maybe things could be different. Maybe we should be sharing more of this information. So uh, I ended up editing a magazine called Information World Review, which reported on what they call the online industry. And again, that was pre-internet. So that was like the big online systems like Lexus, Nexus, Dialog, and so on. Um, and that was when people and that was about the time when the internet started to emerge as a concept and as as a thing and um the open access movement we began to hear sounds about the open access movement at that time mainly from stephen harnell who had written the subversive proposal in i think 1996 or thereabouts and his he, he, his thing was what we now call green open access. He said all researchers should just post all the articles they have published in journals, put a copy on the internet. So it was like, carry on doing what you're doing, uh, but make sure a copy is freely available on, in your institutional repository. And he was very active in setting up institutional repositories and having software written for institutional repositories. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think uh, I did an interview with Stephen Harnow in about uh, to uh, before the Budapest Open Access Initiative, and that was what he was talking about. And then, in I think it was late 2001, they all gathered together in Budapest, and Stephen was one of those. Um, and at that time, particularly with archive being so uh, such a big thing, uh, it was all about researchers posting preprints or articles that they'd written in journals online. It, it was only later that people started to say, well, publishers should be doing this. Publishers should be making it available on open access as well. Uh, and so 
uh, I think it was Dirk Springer from um, uh, he, uh, Dirk Hunk, who was working at Springer at the time, who said uh, in, in a statement he made, let them put their money where their mouth is. So he said, OK, so if researchers want open access, they should pay us for it. <laughs> and that was when he introduced open choice. And from then, you know, the history is that um, increasingly legacy publishers have co-opted the open access movement. Uh, we have also, of course, pure open access publishers, but even uh, publishers like PLOS, they're, they're, they're still charging an article processing charge. So um, it's not, if, if you think about the, the Budapest Open Access Initiative, I think there were, you could say there were three goals. One was to solve the accessibility problem. One was to solve the affordability problem. And one was to solve the equity problem. Now, we can talk about whether open access is solving the accessibility problem, perhaps. But if you take the other two, affordability, I, I think you could probably say that the research community is probably paying more now to distribute and share its research than it was doing under the old uh, subscription Wait, system. I would even argue they're not even paying for distribution. Mm -hmm. I think what the big five publishers in particular, I won't generalize it to all publishers, ask the IPCs for is to have all their costs covered, but the ones who are paying are either libraries or researchers, and they think they're paying for, well, they, they think they're only paying for the submission and processing of the articles to then put online and lay out and form it a little bit, which, and I've been, there have been re uh, research investigations into this. This shouldn't cost more than three or 500 if it's a lot um, US dollars or pounds or euros or whatever currency is um, comparable in value. Um, but then to, for an article to cost for publishing anything around the 1,000 or up to 10,000 is like, we, we need to sense that we're paying for all these other tasks that the publisher engages in, which have nothing to do with the publishing process, from what I understand. Yeah, well, yes, people always argue about the figures. Uh, I, yeah. I have no particular view on how much it costs to publish a paper. But my, my point was that if you think about what universities and research funders are paying now for whatever you want to call it, the publishing, the distribution, whatever you want to call that process in which huh. research is shared, I think that they're paying more now than they were under the old subscription system. So, but whether they're not, they are or they're not, oh, I think okay. we can say yeah. this too. The but affordability the... problem has not been resolved. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if we're focusing on the same venues the fair, or the same publishers, basically, their prices increased in the past, I don't know, five or, or I think that's, that's something we agree on. And I, and I this is an assumption, but I think that's also because they diverted in services, which are not directly related to publishing anymore. And where I was arguing is it's not about dissemination because the dissemination often the publishers ask the researchers to do themselves through social media or whatever channels. So that's not even a task they're engaged in anymore if they ever were. Yeah. So yeah. What's, what's the value other than putting it online? Yes. Um, but, but if you think about the one of the main reasons for the open access movement when it was launched was to reduce costs, that's not been achieved. No. That, that and was the point. It, also the equity aspect failed. Yeah, the equity. Uh, the, the other idea, of course, was that you would be, researchers would share, put, post their papers online and anyone on the round, around the world could get access to them. But in fact, what's happened is the paywall has been replaced by, if you like, a publishing wall, so that in order to publish your articles, you or your funder or your institution has got to pay for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And insofar as it's research, unfunded researchers and research in the global south who cannot afford to pay these fees. So uh, the equity problem has not been resolved in that sense. Mm -hmm. Or if you come back to the accessibility problem, you could argue that that also is likely to uh, prove unsuccessful if you look at the political problems now 
uh, research, there's a great debate about whether um, the researchers in Russia should be included in the system we have. And at what point do people start to say, well, if the country uh, researchers, if China and Russia are not, uh, are not um, engaging with the West in the same way, then why should we be sharing our research with them? You can see the issues over Chinese technology now that um, in the US and, and in the UK here, increasing they're saying uh, we, we shouldn't be buying technology from the Chinese. And also at the same time, we shouldn't be letting them have access to our technology. So uh, one could imagine a world in the future in which you've got uh, research taking place in the West, okay, open access if you want, um, but maybe in Russia they're not able to access it for reasons, maybe political reasons in Russia or the same in China. And then you've got the global South saying, well, we just need to have our own systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you start maybe then to see geo-walled access so that access to certain research papers is available only to researchers in this country or this region or whatever. So um, the question of whether it's solving the accessibility problem still is open for discussion, I think. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. And to some extent that's already the case because there is no equity or no justice in the system, but it's historically grown so. And that's just a fact to acknowledge without blaming anyone or, I mean, just history took its its path. Um, and how, yeah. okay, so looking at the Budapest Initiative, that's been like more than 20 years now. And basically what you're saying and what we're seeing is it's failed completely or it's rather become worse. Um, rather yes, I think that, well, I think you could argue that the open access movement as envisaged in Budapest in 2001 has not has not achieved its goals and uh, it's not entirely clear to me how those goals will be achieved in the near future I, I think that's what I'm saying okay. and to leave a little bit of a positive note there would you still agree that it's important to have the declaration and similar ones um, like the Berlin declaration for open access and as of Dora um, I mean, consecutively so, um, because it's been a reference point for what some might argue the open science movement that's picked up in the, like, yeah, when I was a PhD student, like a decade ago, um, and now brought us to a global conversation about open science, where, yes, it's going into awkward directions, something that we, like, or the, the people, um, who were active um, back in the 80s and 90s were actually trying to prevent from happening. But we have these reference documents to look back to and to reassure ourselves. So this is what we actually want and this is how it can be done. And this is how we now see things turn out. But it gives us a measure to and also tools or arguments to course correct. It's like, yes, I mean, exactly. I mean yeah, I'm just you, seeing you it argue. as a biologist. I've I've done a little bit of evolutionary biology, and I feel it's just how evolution sometimes goes. Sometimes you go in awkward direction. Okay, this this didn't work. Let's try something else. <laughs> yes, exactly. That that that's that's certainly something you could say because we don't know how it's all going to end up. We could be just going through a natural process of things being tried, not working. New things being tried, not working. And eventually something comes up. I mean, it, it's interesting, as you say, that the open access movement has uh, flowered into the open science, science movement, which is much broader, has much greater ambitions. I mean, the idea of open data is a great one. I mean, there's, uh, I think, far more value in making research data freely available than there is in making research papers freely available. Um, if you think about the uh, belief that open access papers should have a CC BY paper uh, license attached, which most open access advocates do now, you, you then find yourself saying, well, what is the point of putting a CC BY license on a paper? Because what's it say that other researchers can use your paper? 
Um, for what? Um, I'm not entirely clear. Sometimes I think some dogma got stuck in there. But yeah, if you come no, to... Think, yeah, I mean, you probably know this better than I, but how I understand it is just because by default in most Western or most countries, they say, I've read in the word, the default state is the content of anything written, like the intellectual property is 100% with the author. And you have to ask, for permission to reuse the content, whereas in research, the whole idea of re is mm. reusing other people's work. Mm. So the idea with a Creative Commons CC BY license is to make that possible as a default state and therefore assign a CC BY license from the start as it's being published. Well, I agree, but if what what are you going to ask permission for? Um, you might want to ask permission, say, to use uh, a chart in a paper. But quite often, I think you'll find with CC BY papers, you might find the chart in there has come from somewhere else anyway, and they've had to ask for permission. I just don't think it's as seamless and frictionless as was envisaged. Uh, but when it comes to, to go back to the open science movement, when it comes to things like open data, um, one can see a real value in being able, somewhat a researcher in one part of the world does a lot of research, but there's a lot, a lot of effort into it, then writes their paper but they make the data available, then that's a huge boon to other researchers who can use that data. They don't really want to use the paper, I suspect, they want to use the data. They read the paper to see what conclusions the researchers came to and they say, yeah, but if we do this with the data, we come to a different conclusion. Yeah, yeah. So that, yeah. that seems far more valuable than uh, ac open access to research papers to me. Oh, you're putting your finger in a widely, like a wide open wound. I think, in the whole how publishing is being conducted nowadays with a, with a paper is being in PDF, too little space for the methodology part and the data sets are often missing. And that's the whole point of the research, you're right. Whereas, and then these papers, the narratives, which are only claims without the data, um, are being cited and then taken for grant, granted for. Yeah. So, so uh, really the value would be in saying, give me your data, tell me what you made of it. Now let me go away with your data and see if I make something different. Maybe, and that would be, you know, the idea of standing on, uh, standing on the shoulders of giants. That would be a real case of you could have, how much money could you save if everyone could get, uh, get the data that someone else uses without having to do all the work themselves and having to pay all that money to collect it. Um, so that's why I think the open science movement is, is definitely a promising thing. And the whole idea of transparency is great. Yeah. Transparency of process. How did these people get to this conclusion? Uh, what were the process they went through? What about the software they used? All that stuff's wonderful to have. That's, um, I can see that's the, the real value of open science if you can get that. Because one of the problems with open data is that people are far less cheery about sharing their data than they are about their research papers because mm -hmm. of the value to them. Uh, you've seen these discussions about the James Webb telescope and the data from that at the moment where uh, that there's an argument out as to whether the people, wh whether the researchers who are involved with it in the first place to gather the data, whether they should have a year to use it before it's made open. Others saying, no, no. It's far more valuable to the world if we can all use it from day one. Yeah. So, the, so, so open data is a, is another hill to climb. <laughs> it's a and it's a steep and very big hill to climb because research is like evolution. It's messy by default, yeah. and it has yeah. to be because otherwise it wouldn't be research. And researchers often, mm -hmm. like including myself, have a sense of imposter syndrome, like a serious one because they feel like, oh, it should be all clear to me. But then unfortunately, nature is a highly complex um, system. And yeah. to simplify that in an app of tube is basically ignoring many of the components and parameters, but or some many of which we're not even aware of. That's for bioscience. So things get always get simplified and yet are complex enough to be messy. And then people have shame, so they don't want to disclose their messiness. 
and the open data is only valuable if it's contextualized and and clean. Yes. And then there is neither time nor budget to, well, not enough thereof, um, to allow for that to happen. And who's supposed to do the data cleaning if the researchers themselves are not trained in doing so? And maybe it shouldn't be because their research interest is of another nature, which wouldn't yeah. necessarily have to do with data creation and data management. But, so I think we can agree there's a lot of work still to be done out there. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of potential for delegation of certain tasks to third parties yeah. and building a whole research ecosystem that's more balanced and more specialized for certain aspects of research that need to be taken care of better. Yeah. And it's surprising to me also sometimes how we've come this far, but maybe that's why we encounter now global threats like climate change, because we didn't really go through mm -hmm. the nitty gritty things of the research being done. Just went for the what looks most shiny and then jump on that opportunity. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, it's also simplified in the analysis, but <laughs> like <laughs> how, how we have like cities like New York City and London, but then also rural areas like still in England where things also work and people live and survive. But yeah. there's tech, tech, yeah, tech based. I don't know, and then the whole, anyways, okay. So open access. Okay, but can we not be so doomed for? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, okay. um, so what I also like to say when conversation goes in that direction, like most, if not, I think most research, I cannot speak for all, but um, really try very hard to do good research with high, um, like high values, high ethical grounds, high, a high sense for research integrity, um, as much as well, or good documentation is feasible and possible. And, and then there's a lot of pressure in the system. And this is why people tend to say the system is broken, but unfortunately we are the system, we're part of it. So we can't really yeah. say, oh, the system is broken if we are in the middle of it. Um, or maybe we can, I don't know. But but I always, like previously it was very convenient convenient for me to also say that or to, to agree when I heard that term, I was like, but now you know what? Let's fix it. If it's so broken, like why why work in a broken system? And yeah. what I see as a train and consultant for open science communication, and like I said, I've been observing and looking into the different alternative routes to take the the alternatives are, are there. They were presented back in the 90s by the Budapest Initiative Committee and other advocates for better practices of research. So yeah. What, what are the good things that you see we should um, make more use of that exist in the system that I would argue is not really broken. We just need to readjust certain, certain. Well, the, the question of assessment, of course, is something that could certainly be addressed. Uh, if, if researchers, if, if the way researchers were assessed were changed, I'm sure that would be very helpful. The question then, I guess, is how you do that, um, and perhaps not to be too doomful. One of the uh, problems with the open access movement is that when researchers didn't all jump on the bandwagon and say, "Yeah, this is great, let's all do this," uh, open access advocates went to funders and governments and said, "Make them do it." <laughs> and once you start f forcing people to do things, they do it unwillingly. And you get new problems. I mean, all the bureaucracy that's mm. involved with it now. And the assessment we, we have now is also very bureaucratic. There must be some way of improving that. So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, how that changes uh, and what the great idea is. I don't know what the great idea is. There are lots of ideas out there. I don't know. Um, I think the real issue comes down to the fact that it's much easier to make assessments mm -hmm. using data rather than like reading their research and things like that. Uh, you know, how do you tell whether the paper's good? Um, do you read it? Do you look at what journal it was published in? What the impact factor of that journal is? What do you do? I don't. I don't. I don't know that that the cheap and easy way always is to use data, and, and there's been discussion 
as to whether AI should be used for helping the assessment process. But that alarms a lot of people, I think, for understandable reasons. So on a positive note, that's what we can look to improve. Mm -hmm. And I don't have an answer to it, but I look forward to discovering what the answer is. Yeah, I think one answer is already to steer the discussion and give a few access points like you just did with AI, which is already being deployed in many aspects of science communication for the review yeah. process to actually go and scrape through the data and the text. I think I'm, I'm just, as you as you were calling out, um, isn't the data set the actual research output? And yes, it is. But why are we so obsessed with the research articles? which are the narrative, which are actually the contextualization, so the metadata to the data set. And if we just change, switch the perception of the two, to, to focus more on the data set, and then use the narrative to describe it as the context, which it is, and yeah, and not ignore, well, not, not the other way around, as it currently mm. seems to be happening most of the time. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, but I mean, I, I, I guess the social, the the um, the public issue here is that taxpayers fund an awful lot of research and researchers and universities, and uh, so the public, I guess, and governments acting in their name want to know whether these researchers are doing a good job, yeah. and uh, are are is are the dollars that are being pushed their way being well used yeah. and that's where you end up with the obsession with assessment but the the challenge is finding the the right assessment system or a proper way of doing it yeah and, and, and for yeah. that we have like um i mean calling out the quantitative assessments um with as of dora mm -hmm. and now to implement the recommendation for dora and others with quara um a coalition also of, of open research assessment or something. Sorry, um, acronyms are not my strong foot. But we had some, also a conversation on this podcast about that, and I can share the link with you unless you're already familiar with, with this initiative, which I presume you are. But for the listeners, we can also put it in the show notes. Um, so, okay. so that, but there also with the, the people who are involved in the coordination of the Quara activities now to implement the recommendations for qualitative assessments is highly not even discipline specific but research topic specific what 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 is a qualitative feature and is to be therefore measured positively um but what is measurable is like did the authors share share the data set openly or mm -hmm. in, a, in a, a responsible manner, making sure sensitive data is not being shared, isn't that? So we have that, which is cross-cutting, cross-disciplines, but then it's really specific on what extent of data sharing is even feasible in a certain um, research topic and research project. And that's that, I think that's, that just cannot be generalized. Yeah, that's one of the issues. And that, uh, the, the next question becomes, how do you do this for humanities researchers? Mm. How do you, I, I, there was an article I was reading yesterday talking about uh, assessing historians and they were saying, well, actually historians have been for a while doing things that are very useful to the public, like blogging, like giving public lectures, uh, like uh, being, if you like, public intellectuals who appear on the radio and on TV talking about things. Um, the question then, and that's where the article got to is, but how do you measure all this? How do you say uh, this blog is better than that blog? You know what I mean? It's, How often it's, do they need to pause a blog post like to make it worthwhile to, to an audience? Um, also, like, I would also argue that we need the researchers who are, well, researchers by, by default, and I think that's also cross-cutting or might be more or less for certain disciplines, are uh, rather introvert mm -hmm. as a character trait. Yeah. So then yes. Yes. they might prefer one, one 
communication channel or with the other. So it turns out that introvert people are very eloquent on Twitter or I don't know, just to name one commercial brand. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's also a lot of controversy nowadays. But so why would you punish a researcher who is hesitant about going public with their output? And then there is a whole league of science journalists like yourself who could take on that task to disseminate to the public. So that's also not a good measure, I would argue. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult. Um, I, 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 what one idea that does intrigue me, because if you think about the whole process of evaluation in terms of funding, it's also a very expensive process. And there are, there have been people suggesting, occasionally you hear them suggesting, actually it should be a lottery. You just say, uh, we've got this money and we're going to distribute it to a certain number of universities and we'll pull straws and see who gets it. And those who make that point say the results would be the same. You'd still get good research, you'd get some bad research, but there wouldn't be much difference. You'd have saved all that money. Uh, and if you think about um, the amount of labor put into applying for grants, it's extraordinary. <laughs> um, and the real problem is there's a shortage of money, not that um, these people have to compete so that uh, the best rise to the top or whatever. I mean, it's, it's a whole skill in itself, right? Uh, applying for a grant. But is it useful time spent mm. if you instead said, Let's just distribute this money for, because part of anything else, usually the money goes to the um, the, the top journal, the top universities, um, and so you end up with this process of uh, you're fighting against equity again there in a way, aren't you? Mm. If you say all the money goes to the Russell Group universities in the UK, for instance, mm. um, what about all the good research that could be done um, in the polytechnic of whatever? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's also a problem we have now in Germany or Europe with the excellence clusters, where, yes. I mean, yes, there was a competition to start from, from but this was was never uh, on equal grounds because the starting point was with different levels of research capacity to start from to produce certain output yes. that can then be compared and then assign funding to. So the funding... Yeah. Like it also happens on a global scale, naturally when to the ones who already have good stand, standing to start with. Um, so would you think that a funding approach that is more, is it democratic or, or already communist to, <laughs> to just pour out the money across institutions without looking into qualifiers? Or do we yes, need papers like uh, attitude for research sharing and transparency and like, and then also, I mean, well, the exactly. attitude alone, like the commitment is also again just a claim. So there needs to be a written commitment. I think that's also what some funders require nowadays a commitment to that's then tied to a, like, if you don't comply with this as the research starts and, and, and like th th three or six months in, um, the funding is being cut again. So you need yeah. to make sure you document well, you need to, but everybody gets a fair, but that's also not equitable. That's, that's. Well, exactly. I mean, that, that, that's, that's one of the, that is one of the major problems the open access movement has had to face. The fact mm. is that um, the, the system as it operates today is not equitable. And just by sharing a few research papers isn't going to make it equitable. Mm. Uh, that's why it has to be something has to change politically, um, and on a global or regional basis, it has to change politically in order for significant change to happen. And as you say, once you have these excellent excellence clusters, that when it's just like money gets sucked into these few places, and that's not <laughs> equitable, is it? Because mm. um, Unless you accept that these uh, Russell Group universities, say in the UK, have recruited all the very best researchers in the world, and so they should get the money. But that goes against the whole principle of what open access was meant to be about, wasn't it? It was about sharing things equally. 
Right. But can I can I ask you a question, by the way? Uh, I was wondering what what your views on the role of publishers are in the um, sharing of research. I think they should get better at curation of content, and that's where they also have mm -hmm. uh, strengths. With, I mean, especially the big publishers with by deploying AI for for the purpose of data curation and not for for the purpose of selling the data to third parties necessarily. So um, what would a what would a, a better system involve in terms of publishing research and what role in that would publish? I mean everyone's very excited about preprints at the moment. So what would happen? It would start with uh, researchers putting preprints on a preprint server. And then a journal would maybe come along and say, yeah, that looks like a good paper. Uh, why don't we have that peer reviewed and publish it? Yeah. And, and then and would that be a, a large publisher like Elsevier or Springer, or would it be just a small journal? Um, what, and what, yeah. where would the process go from there? Yeah, that's a question also that, like we had the United Nations Open Science Conference just last week. Um, whereas the question of why do Western publishers in particular are the big, not only five, but now big with also PLOS and others in the game, um, yeah. big 10 or so, um, why do they have to have a global scope? Because that now undermines the regional journal infrastructure. Because, and then also like, so that's one aspect. And then when a researcher from Kenya submits a research that's comparing two countries, like one in Kenya, one in somewhere in Asia, and then the argument for rejection is it's not global enough. It's not of global interest because, and probably because no Western country was involved in the study. Like what? So they are also missing the point, the editors, at sometimes of having a global scope and what that, that means. Um, yes. but it's just, uh, I'm just referring a case where I've come across um, without being specific. But so why do we need that? And there's, I mean, the answer was from, from PLUS, like, yes, we need a common conversation or a venue where global conversations can happen. But then wouldn't we then need to have journal names like global investigations or journal for global investigations into climate change, something like that? instead yeah. of calling it journal for climate change at whatever publisher and that's then redundant across all the publishers that you have which you know put on climate change as one of their topics and then it's it's a matter of prestige or peer pressure and the price point where then the researchers feel they have to publish to make their careers and that's yeah. that's just not healthy I and mean, this is what we're now complaining about so a better approach, I think, and also like I also asked the question to someone from from science, which has a different approach, and I think also a better approach because they focus more on the curation. Of, they have five journals or six now, um, not hundreds and thousands with all kinds of niche disciplines, which again you could argue is a curational approach, but I don't know. So fewer journals, but then the revenue comes from subscriptions by institutions. So it's free to publish it for the authors, but the price point might be the same, just um, asking the money from the institution. Uh, only, that is, because other publishers take both, take money from both ends. <laughs> but so, um, but yeah, so how the revenue streams and the financing streams from publishing are also like something that's highly complex. I or maybe not so complex if you look at the details. Um, and now, okay, so but then I asked, so with preprints now so strong in the game, what if the game changes, as in the publishers compete for preprints to be allowed to publish in their outlets? And then yes. you would assume then the publisher being asked to pay money to the research institutions to get that output because that's the actual value. <laughs> that's the actual currency to have to assign your brand to knowledge that's been produced in the research institution with taxpayers' money. So this is where the value is coming from, not the other way around. 
And then the publishing part is only a couple hundred bucks, like worth right. of, of labor. Um, and then they they would I think they would have to find other in, income streams um, and charge other stakeholders inside and outside academia for all the other things they're doing with data analysis and uh, content scraping and whatnot for whatever purpose. But it shouldn't be academia to pay for that. Um, right. So yeah, I also don't have I haven't thought this through, but I think like. <sighs> And also, I mean, we still have diamond journals which existed since decades and continue to exist. They're just struggling nowadays. And they've probably yeah. always struggled for funding and, and HR capacity, but but now particularly so. And so again, it's just a matter of re, re being like reminding researchers of or also upgrading the diamond journals to make them more discoverable or they probably already are like, because that what, that's what the research needs to be discoverable across stakeholders in society or across several societal sectors. That, so that's basically what the publishers provide, the DOI assignment, the indexing and, and literature discovery databases. And that's when the research can have its impact, ho hopefully positively <laughs> to society. So, and, so so would you envisage a world in which there were uh, thousands and thousands of journals maybe being published in universities and there was a, the, the publishers were maybe then indexing and pulling in all that data and producing a different kind of product in terms of data analytics. And that maybe the big, uh, glossy journals uh, were somehow became redundant because the, the value was in amassing all that content that's being published by all these journals around the world and doing something useful with that data. Yeah, or maybe they can just reorient themselves into data analysis instead of publishing because that's again what they yes. do anyway. Well, well, I think that's what I'm saying, that they yeah. would just the, all this, all these research papers would be published within universities or on preprint servers or wherever, and the the big publishers would then harvest all that content and make it more valuable by bringing it together, by providing indexing tools, by uh, all mm. the, all the kind of things that um, that large company like Elsevier can do. Exactly, and I think this actually also works in a capitalist world because. They can then charge industry parties to sell their data analysis or data analysis products too, which then can turn the research knowledge into products to sell back to society. And that's a healthy circle, I would say. So, if the um, products the, of the industry are actually useful for society. The question then arises is that how do all these diamond journals fund themselves? in order to sustain over time? Well, that's a question that's still not answered today for the current status, I think. I mean, they might have institutional funding for the little maintenance work that they currently do or are capable of doing. And they probably need more there. I mean, I'm not so familiar with how else Diamond, I think what I know how diamond journals are funded is either from their host institution or external funding by foundations. And then there's- Yeah, no I mean, their weakness I assume is that they don't generally have a revenue stream. And in order for something to sustain over time in the world we inhabit at the moment is you seem to need to have a steady stream of money. And it, it, it doesn't really work for say uh, a funder to say, oh, well, we'll give you enough money or for a, a, um, a private charity organization to say, okay, we'll give you funding to keep your journal going for five or 10 years. Uh, and then they go off and they, they, they run the journal for five or 10 years and then they face the war. What do we do now? I mean, that, yeah, and maybe that's, that's good that's enough of a lifetime or what is a half lifetime for a journal sometimes if, if you know, if they 
publish on a product that only is relevant for a certain era in but okay but given that so i think it depends also on the stake like an institution a research institution has a stake in maintaining hosting and also publishing their own research output and to make it glossy is not a big deal nowadays you don't need uh, expensive ink everything is digital so you can make it glossy also from a university um venue. Well, that's an interesting that's an interesting point you raised there actually that there might be a a lifetime for a journal that it doesn't need to go on forever because yeah. it serves a purpose for five or ten years and then is replaced by something else it doesn't matter so long as the content in it is not lost and so if you had say a large publish a large analytics company hoovering up all the content it wouldn't matter if that journal disappeared yeah i think we also need less content really because what's oh, also happening is um salami slicing due to the publication pressure so a lot of the research is also because of the closed access a lot of research is being painfully often repeated and that's on the expense of our environment with carbon emission being one of the aspects only not to count all the medical research and the animals are being sacrificed in the process for no reason. But um, so so I think we will also have fewer publications, but we have also more researchers. So the decline in, in public like like articles or data sets that are being produced will shrink, but still be more as compared to 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, probably. But, um, um, but and, well, it would be of more value. So I think what there's also a term that uh, um, we come back to, we were able to come back to slow science if we apply qualitative measures yeah. to allow more time for a researcher to produce good results that are actually useful for the community to look at in the first place <laughs> and not just producing numbers and papers for the sake of it. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm being a bit, um, judgmental here but I mean this is also I don't know this is also I think commonly accepted that we overproduce and that's not in in a threatened ecologically threatened absolutely. system like the world is currently at is not absolutely and of course another issue um, that's often raised in terms of equity is the fact that English is has become the language of science now yes, no, that's the assumption sorry I was intervening also yesterday yeah, yeah, I know, but I'm saying this is an issue. Yeah. This is an issue that's discussed. And what I'm saying is that uh, because some people might say, okay, if you've got all these thousands of journals around the world being published within universities, they'll all be in different languages. But but now with um, AI and so forth, these big uh, scoopers up of content could translate it in, into any language on the fly. So that that could address that issue, couldn't it? Yes, I mean, with a little bit of pinch of salt, because translating research is not straightforward as a natural language processing. No. That's where, yeah, it's more. But that's assuming but things get better. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 assuming... yeah, yeah. And I'm a huge advocate for multilingualism in academia, and there's many routes we can take to, to foster that and to have more of that. So, and I think that's also part of open access to provide a language access point or to yeah. like to provide a translation of your research as you publish. And does, it shouldn't matter if you're a native English speaker or not. Like every researcher that has an international scope of their research should publish in more than one language, at least the summary. That's, that's just my- Well, yes, yeah, so though I suppose what I'm saying is if the technology got good enough, it wouldn't really matter because translations could take place on the fly. I understand your point about it not being quite so simple when it comes to scientific. Uh, yeah, but papers. even even for that, I mean, I think a researcher would still be able or have colleagues of other ethnic, ethnic or linguistic backgrounds um, in the network to produce a machine translation of the abstract, which is already shorter of um, acronyms and and does, like research specific terminology as compared to the body text and then so yeah and then just produce yourself machine translation supported uh, summary of I think that's totally doable and 
it should not be left to the non-native English speakers alone, but any, like, yeah, at some point in some previous interview, it struck me, why don't the native speakers also have to do that? Like, yeah. <laughs> like just to, yeah, just to provide more access to, to their outcomes. Well, uh, I, I have to say, I like this idea that we seem to have developed of having all these uh, diamond journals published in institutions all around the world and freely available on the internet and then a big uh, harvester comes in scoops them all up does wonderful things with all that content brings it all together and not only it. one like like with, with knowing of the danger of monopolization like also the harvesting needs to be okay. so, so not one but um as, however many there are the question then is how do you create that world but the, do you I, think it's happening while we're talking that it, it, it's it's in development at the moment we can't necessarily see it or is it some has something got to be done to make it happen no well for sure it already happens and um it's being talked about at publisher con conferences which also invite researchers to some extent so the conversations are not necessarily deliberately hidden. They, they occur in circles where the people, the actors circulate. Um, and yeah, I think again, it's a matter of evolution, like which service and service providers prevails and survives the first and second year of their existence. Um, to prove themselves useful and be adopted by the users, which can, would be the researchers and the research managers. I don't know, but I think also it doesn't have to be a perfect system. Nature is also not perfect, um, but we need to get back to a more balanced state where we can make use of the research output that's being produced in a better way to make it accessible to society and to actually challenge and mitigate the threats that we're currently um, experiencing. But it be, but what you're saying does require change, doesn't it? Yeah, for sure. So the question then is, who's responsible for making that change and how does it happen? Um, it's already happening. I, mean, I think every stakeholder, so the policymakers need to be informed about what the issues are and how they can be rectified. And that's happening all across the world. The UNESCO came out with a, for that purpose to facilitate their process. They came out with the United Nations recommendations, UNESCO recommendations or for open science or open science recommendation with a list of, and it's also like Dora's like recommendations on what should be taken in the, into account for a globalized research community to serve societies around the world. And yeah, sure. I mean, I'm conscious that there are always documents produced, mm. and there have been ever since the Budapest Open yeah. Access. Okay, oh, and now we're back to the beginning of the conversation. I know what, how, who makes sure that this is being implemented, but I'm trying to. Uh, yeah. Good, <laughs> <but I'm> good. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So then it's a case of should we. Uh, should we rely on lots of individuals like you bringing about change or do we need governments funders to come in as they have done with open access mandates and say this has to be done yeah no both What's i think it, yeah as always i think it needs a grassroots mm -hmm. bottom up top down approach and both to, to meet in the middle and then implement there right but <laughs> But I think that again, I think there's also a very common natural um, symptom. I don't know if I call it a symptom, but with a fox and the hare situation, I think that's where we have too many foxes in the room. We need more hares, and the hares being the diamond open access, like journal right. repositories where the foxes are the commercial publisher. And I think we can. We, there's there's room for both. If, right. And and sometimes you know in the past I don't know when was it before, I think until the sixties or so there were more hairs, more diamond outlets, and then the commercial then it became commercialized. 
and also in part for good reasons, because again, what, what we were arguing before, there was a need to specialize in the pro on the publishing process where there were no real experts, like librarians are not trained to publish necessarily, they are trained to curate. And, right. actually, and then publishing was like a side hustle for them. So why not mm -hmm. um, why not give that task to someone who's, who's mm -hmm. specializing in the publishing mm -hmm. group? Mm -hmm. it's just, um, it's, I think it's, it needs awareness raising all the problem academic institutions of how what's our budget and how much of that budget do we want to allocate to the actual publishing and is that actually the value that we're getting from the publisher what we need for the research to to have uh, an impact to society which is what the funders are asking for and hopefully also the researcher aims for with doing the right. research in the first place. right so there's a kind of uh, process happening out there that we can't put our arms around at the moment, perhaps, but yeah. that it may be beginning to move in the right direction. Is that what you're saying? I think it's always been moving and it's like different people and stakeholders keep pulling on different ends of the string. And it's not a string really, it's a network. And I think it's also hard to capture the full picture as you and I are trying to do that and are also struggling because there's so many ends to it. So many aspects to, to yes of course, another um common problem with the development of open access has been the the unintended consequences part yeah where you make a policy change you you make some kind of change to the way an institution works and you get directly the opposite result to what you wanted <laughs> or you get a new problem emerge uh how you avoid that i do not know but i do think that um a lot more should have been done in the early days mm. to look at potential problems. Yeah, I think that's always a danger as people come together and or in any, like the, the phrase opening Pandora's box, you want to open something and then you don't know what you get. Or in Germany, we had the, I think, was it Goethe? Oh, sorry, mm. I'm not good with. So we had this poem about the magician uh, student mm -hmm. who accidentally, no, who was taught a new trick to get a broom, do its job by itself. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. And then the broom gets wired on it and then he doesn't know how to stop it. I think that's where we yeah, are. Yeah. This is what we know. Yeah, that's also in the film Fantasia. That's a uh -huh. wonderful cartoon shows that. <laughs> But um, I have another question for you, and that is, you're aware of what the Indian government's plan to do with its One Nation, One Subscription? Uh, uh, I haven't followed through, but I was following that they were first into Plan S and then not. Yes. Um, um, well, their current, the government's current thinking is that they will go to all the major publishers and say, we want to negotiate a national big deal with you, which would provide access, not just to all our researchers, but to any citizen. And we will pay you uh, whatever the agreed sum is. Mm. And in fact, this, is, this has was done in Egypt with their knowledge bank. Mm. And it's what uh, Uruguay has done. Mm. And uh, it occurred to me, it occurs to me that you could argue that that is providing open access, even though it's a subscription deal. Uh, India, if it manages to agree these deals, can, can say, we have open access in India. All our researchers and our citizens can access all the science that's published by all these publishers. Um, and that would solve, well, not necessarily solve, but it would avoid a lot of the current mess we have of how you manage article processing charges, how you manage a subscription system alongside an open access publishing system. The one thing it wouldn't do, of course, is India paying for access for all this wouldn't provide open access for the rest of the world. But that's why when I said earlier on, we might end up with a situation like that where uh, governments say, 
Well, what we want to do is provide all our citizens and our scientists with access to scientific information. And this is the best way of doing it. I mean, do, do you have views on, on whether that's a good idea or not? I'm not sure if I fully understand the bigger picture, but what I'm cautious about is that this again focuses only on the commercial, mm -hmm. the few commercial publishers, and we have so many more out there. Mm -hmm. um, and then it would again re incentivize researchers in India in this case to focus on high impact factor journals, which is what we're trying to get rid of. Yeah. yeah. And we're having similar conversations in Africa. Well, not to get a whole continent together because it's just too federated mm -hmm. as a system and too mm -hmm. diverse also as in terms of various capacities and, and interests. But yeah, I mean, the challenge is I think the same for everyone, but, but these transformative agreements and big deals, I think it's just, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's reinforcing the problem that we mm -hmm. have today. Nice. And nice. It's just putting another label to us, like it won't make anything more affordable or more equitable because yeah, but that, yeah, and that's why I say in the end these are, these are issues that have to be solved politically. I think because the Indian government is quite rationally, I think, saying what we need to do is ensure that our researchers have access to the latest scientific research. This is being published in, by these publishers. We must get them access to it. And they might even say, well, that's fine if Europe wants to uh, publish all its research open access because we can use that too. So that, that's where national interests may be coming to conflict with the idea of open access because the government's responsibility is to look out for its own citizens, isn't it? Yeah, or the governments need to better understand how no, preprints can work and facilitate that process because what's also being increasingly adopted by the big publishers, meaning the big five, again, the commercial ones, um, is a preprinted journal. And then you have a copy or a, yeah, a, a, like a version of what's eventually being published behind the paywall or for a high fee is already available in green of an access or diamond or whatever. And then the question is why? I mean, this is also when we started Africa Archive, I was like, okay, mm -hmm. if you like to get to avoid the barriers that they have in editorial processes as an African researcher, like let's face it, like pure racism or ignorance of that there's actual research going on in the continent. Um so to avoid the the this um unnecessary high rejection rate um you can just share your preprint and if you want to if you have the budget and your need is for your career which unfortunately also african researchers do because also there is a publication pressure with an obsession about the impact factor because that's been um established over the past i don't know two decades or so um then you may as well also publish the article, but you don't have to because it's already accessible. Mm. The mission is already accomplished at this point for yeah. no fee at all. I mean, unless we also struggle for a revenue stream, but this could be so regionally with funding. Well, yeah, revenue stream again is the issue. I mean, Archive has, has, has had to struggle with that yeah. issue about funding. Um, and again, you can start to see legacy publishers moving into the preprint business and and so uh, at some point, I mean, I think some preprint servers now are already charging people to deposit their papers. So you can see that the money issue begins to play into it again, because uh, preprint servers might say, well, w it costs us money to run this thing. Uh, we've got to get some funding from somewhere. Yeah. Um, maybe we need to charge for submissions. Uh, yeah, and like we've also just for a, for a second thought about that, but um, I mean, I think preprint repositories made a promise to the community, they will always be free of charge to the individual, but they can still be subsidized and supported and financed by other stakeholders. Right. Like, and they have to be to be sustainable. Okay, because you mentioned also on your website or in your bio that you're getting all kinds of, because you're very outspoken about opportunities and challenges with open access, some of which we discussed here. So what is the biggest 
backlash you're getting. I call it backlash because you mentioned, I mean, you don't call it that, but you say that you have both supporters of your statements and critiques, like who are then very quite aggressive in their rejection of your suggestions that you're making in your blog post. Yes, uh, it's interesting that when in the past I've been criticized, I've seen people tweeting things like, who is this guy? Uh, is he a scientist? And, and replies coming about like, he's just a bloke with a blog. <laughs> so uh, I mean, it's the usual thing where uh, people will try and undermine you in the ways that suit them best. So if they say, well, he's not a scientist, he's not a researcher, he's not even employed by a university, then we don't have to take him seriously mm -hmm. or, or, or or whatever, you know, I mean, it's, um, you know, how people will try and discredit you. Uh, mm -hmm. It just happens. And, and in, in, the, in the world of social media, it, it happens um, in, in very particular ways. Although I, I must admit, I haven't um, had any particular issues recently. I, I think that, uh, well, I suspect that people have realized that some of the things that I was pointing out are actually right. Yeah. That, that we've moved from one particular problematic system to another. Mm. So they're now um, looking for other ways of trying to resolve it. As, you, as we said earlier on, the, the, this can go one of two ways. The system can, the, the movement can fail or it can um, morph into something different and look for different solutions. And Diamond Open Access is one of those solutions that everyone is excited about at the moment, as with preprints, mm. preprint servers. But you do eventually have to come back to the problem, how do you fund this over the long term? How is this funded? Well, and I, think the, I think it's clear what the budget items are, and it's clear what the cost is or the ranges they're in. And then it's just, for me, it's just a matter of adjusting those parameters. You know, when, um, you know, VTech Trash, who's set up Biomed Central, no. the entrepreneur, he, uh, he, was, he was instrumental in, uh, from the publisher's side, in establishing the open access movement. And in an interview he gave uh, way back in about 2003, he said that the costs of publishing papers will fall and fall over time and eventually become zero. And at that time, Biomed Central was charging, uh, I think, $525 to publish a paper. And since then, the price has gone up and up. Now, he predicted the price would fall, but it's gone up. And so when you say uh, preprint, the price, the cost of preprint service will fall, the cost of diamond OHS, or whatever, that these, these prices will fall, I'm going to be skeptical because it's not what we've seen historically. Prices That's why I think the cost has fallen. The cost, the production cost has fallen because it's become more efficient in the digital space now. But the price are going up. But these are different things, right? If you, if you talk to a publisher, they'll start saying, uh, they'll start talking about metadata. They say met, uh, introducing metadata is, is very. I know, but they're not generally speaking. They're not doing a good job there. So also you would argue no. it's the researchers' job to send the metadata because that's the actual contextualization of also now the PDF and the PDF is not a good format because it's not machine readable to the extent it could and should be. Yeah. So I think what I'm saying is that everyone thought that it was just a matter of putting things on the web mm. and the problem was solved. But in fact, digital publishing has turned out to be vastly more complicated than anyone envisaged. That's what I'm saying. So there are costs there. I don't know what the costs are. People will argue about the costs, what the real costs are. Uh, I'm not sure we'll ever get to the truth on that. Yeah, um, I think it's only because some, some budget items like what do the shareholders get and what else are we doing that we want to pay our staff for, like these are not disclosed and we need more transparency there. So yes, transparency, but the, the costs of publishing have gone down. That's a matter of fact. But then the price goes up because the researchers are now paying to publish, but they're paying not only the publishing, they're paying all the other things that are also happening at the publishing publisher's house. 
Right, okay. But of course, if you want uh, public research on the internet to be of value, someone's got to do work to it, apart from just writing the paper, haven't they? Particularly if you want a search system that can find research you're interested in. Yeah, now that's a question that's really key. And we have the lens. I'm a big fan of the lens. Richard right. Jackson has been also on this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and but the lens, but think about the lens. They've had to move to a freemium model, haven't they? They have yes, what they call it. Yeah, because they also, I mean, also like Africa Archive and all the preprint repositories, they're passion driven. There was a gap in the system. We need a better way to disseminate the research, which is less costly or free, because it's already being paid for with the taxpayers' money, this and that. So um, in the lens, was living on or existing on philanthropic subsidies yeah. and support yeah. for the longest time and then from what i know is they realize eventually we need to be self-sustaining to some extent or to 100 percent preferably yeah. well that's my point and that's what's happened to core at the open university they were getting funded by jisc jisc has said it's withdrawing the funding so they've had to introduce some paid for services as well and that's what I'm saying is that's maybe how it goes in the end. You start out and you think this service could be free or very low cost. Over time, you suddenly realize that in order to keep going, you mm. need money from somewhere. Yeah, and that's a very corporate approach or entrepreneurial approach. I'm learning all these things as a sole entrepreneur. And you probably also have like to sustain my own livelihood doing the work that I do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and I think there's nothing wrong with that as long as I think the problem really starts when we introduce shareholders who have their only interest is to increase their profit and any product, and it doesn't have to be non-commercial, like any product has a purpose of serving society one way or the other. And that purpose is being lost over the profit generation, like only three years or sooner into into its existence. And that's and I think that's the problem with capitalism. But I think capitalism yeah. to say is not the problem, but the approach to to seed fund and to share the cost of building a company, because that's quite costly and takes about a decade apparently, or any organization really to to get a product or service on the market with adoption yeah. and all of that. Yeah. And that's being speeded up with by shareholders who invest their money, but they want to have a return of their investment. And that's, and they expect that often to be in, in prof, like monetarily. And I think that's, that's, what, that's yeah, where. So, so if you're not going to involve shareholders in order to find the money to invest, what you're going to have like a co-op where everyone contributes something to it? Or how does it, how do you, what is the funding model that oh, replaces maybe, maybe shareholders but it must be clear as you're giving the money you invest as a shareholder you invest the money you're not expecting anything back because you already have a surplus from your own product that you've developed so why would you want to even make more money i think we need to cap profits in this world we don't need the bill gates and the whoever's who have ridiculously amounts of profits on their banks like well i i agree with you wholeheartedly but that's why i keep coming back to saying in the end these are political problems because uh, you can't solve uh, ha the, the question i guess is to what extent can researchers and universities operate outside the capitalist system i don't think it's political because economies are not necessarily tied to political rules yeah but Politics determines how governments are run and governments decide how universities are run. I, I'm just saying I don't think that the research community can step outside the larger political system and operate at those in a vacuum. That, that's my suspicion. Okay, so coming back to, so I think what we need in the corporate world more of is values and values are being reintroduced into academia now with open science and it's not that they never existed in academia but we're being reminded of through the open science movement and advocates like john tennant or the late john tennant and others and yeah yeah um so yeah and then the question is also what's a reasonable price and that can range and differ 
but it needs to be in a certain reasonable scale. Okay. <laughs> I don't know who's to determine that. I think that's not politics. Who's, yeah, who's going to determine that? And yet it'd be like politicians, <laughs> won't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, I wish we could solve this for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> No, we, we, don't, we don't have the full answer yet, but we're working towards it, right? Yeah, and we've, I think we've touched on a few crucial aspects for to enlighten ourselves as to further, and also for others maybe to reconsider their approach to whatever we're doing in academia. Okay. And I think as well, I think it's like with, with buying or, organic food in the supermarket or not, what I the problem I have with open science and open access, why do we need a label for something that should be a default state? Like organic food is the only food that's really healthy and natural and good for our bodies as a system and good for the environment and the production circle. Why do we need to label that to make it look artificial or strange? Yeah. Um, but, well, I agree with you. It's a matter of how you do that, how you bring it about. That's the that's the issue. <laughs> right. I'm I'm really sorry about the whining, but the dog is keen on getting Yeah, I think you've got to go give him a walk, haven't you? <laughs> oh isn't yeah. But but I think I think he's expressed a few interesting views as we've gone along. <laughs> I think so, yeah. I think he's very supportive he's, of he's, our he's obviously a dog with opinions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, I, I just interpret it as being supportive of both our arguments. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, thank you so much, Richard. It's been a real pleasure. Um, nice to talk to you. Likewise. And yeah, maybe we can meet again here sometime yeah. on the, the timeline um, and discuss maybe one particular aspect that we've touched upon only today. Okay. And maybe something interesting comes up in the in the ecosystem or in, in new developments that we can bounce ideas about again. Okay, great. Nice to talk to you. Yeah, likewise. And yeah, let's let's keep doing the work. Okay. <laughs>